It's Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We're here to bring you another COVID-19 update. Today, we want to talk about how we can better learn from each other uh, to reduce harm in healthcare. And I'm really excited to be joined today by Helen Hughes. She's the Chief Executive at Patient Safety Learning in the UK. Hi, Helen. Hi there. Thanks so much for joining. No, thank you. It's a great privilege to be asked. Thank you. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background. Very quickly, uh, I've got an unconventional background in patient safety in that I'm not a, I am not don't have a clinical background, but I've been passionate and engaged in patient safety for about 20 years. Uh, in the UK, there's a big report, Organization with a Memory, that came out just after the US's to Eris Human. And it was light bulb flashing moments for me. I was in a leadership role in healthcare at the time, and since then I'm been committed to uh, redesign healthcare for improved safety. So I've worked at a national level at the National Patient Safety Agency here in the UK, and I had the privilege of working with Sir Liam Donaldson and colleagues at the World Health Organization in setting up the WHO program on patient safety. And I've worked in a range of leadership roles in safety and social justice organizations. Wonderful. Well, tell us a little bit about the background of patient safety learning. How did this great resource come about? Yeah, well, Patient Safety Learning's been a, ch it's a charity. Uh, it's a UK-based charity with kind of global ambitions and reach. Um, and we came about, there was a group of um, experts and advisors, patient experts, uh, and our chairman, who is uh, the found, founding chief exec of, of what is now RL Datix. Um, but we had professors, we had advisors, we had patients, really frustrated that healthcare, health and social care, but mainly healthcare, was not seeing the improvement we needed to see in patient safety and felt that healthcare systems were looking, they're a much better understanding about why we needed to change to improve safety and reduce harm, uh, had a better understanding about what we needed to do, but there weren't really that many tools to help people deliver the how. And we felt that we had uh, an opportunity to be, as a charity, to speak truth to power, to, to give messages that we felt were needed for policymakers and politicians to make changes, and that we could do something very actively to support uh, frontline clinicians, leaders in patient safety, uh, and to translate ideas into action and to address the implementation gap. So that was our sort of passion about why we felt we needed to be created and, and uh, make a difference. So what are your organizational goals for improving patient safety? So what we want to be is an organization that helps improve safety and reduce harm. And we don't want to be an organization that just produces policy, papers, think tank. There are a lot of organizations that do that and do that very well. But we, in order to help kind of people understand our thinking and to shape the action that we would take, we have actually done a bit of work on our policy thinking and we have produced a report. And it's called A Blueprint for Action. Uh, and we'll put all the details so that people can have a look at it. What we've done in that report is to reflect on the last 15 to 20 years of thinking on patient safety. And from a systems perspective, from an organizational and a health and social care system perspective, we've tried to answer the question, why is harm so persistent? So again, from what I was saying earlier, we know, we know the scale of unsafe care, we know the cost of it, the tragic cost in people's lives, we know the financial cost, the waste of resource from unsafe care, and we kind of know what we need to, to do. There's lots of reports and inquiries, US, UK, European, global, but how do we, how do we make the change we need to see? And we did a, a really big evidence-based kind of analysis of, of that 20 years worth of research and we've drawn out kind of seven key messages which I will share briefly with you um, that we think are uh, uh, a system issues that need to be tackled in order to undertake um, to, to reduce harm and improve safety. So we know we have a lot of programs, it could be on infection control, it could be on VTE, on falls, you know, clinically specific areas, safe surgery. But if you look at the kind of issues that come from inquiries and unsafe care, we think there's one overarching issue that is 
core, which is that patient safety and, and uh, uh, avoidable harm, the reduction of avoidable harm, has to be the core of every organization and everyone working in the organization. If it's patient safety initiatives are one of many priorities, that are being balanced, then often the other priorities will take greater precedence, whether it's financial priorities or whether you're given volume targets or whatever they are, they will often take priority. And the presumption is that if you have really good clinicians uh, working collaboratively, then the safety just follows. And we know it doesn't. We know from other industries um, outside of health and social care, we know you have to design a system for safety. Um, and so, that's the overarching uh, kind of aim. And then what we've identified is six foundations for patient safety. Uh, and and I, don't, I think people that are watching this will be familiar with many of them. But what we've, what we've brought together is a, a real sense of what action needs to be taken to achieve these. So why it's called a blueprint for action is that we're proposing, you know, what those the, the barriers to harm, to, the, to reducing harm are, and then what action needs to be taken. So they're very tangible, uh, and they are around leadership, and that's around organizational leadership and system leadership. That's about setting goals, having leaders behave and, and, and commit to patient safety. It's about shared learning and, and finding systematic ways of learning and sharing that learning, learning from when things go wrong, but really importantly, learning from when things go right. So, you know, the whole safety one, safety two dichotomy, but the innovation that we're seeing in the UK and I'm, I think globally in, as people are responding to the, the COVID-19 pandemic and making changes to improve safety those initiatives, some of those, uh, you love, I know you've spoken to Rachel Card Medic as, as one that we were actively promoting. There's fabulous stuff that's working. And how do we get that out across the health and social care system? How do we do that within our country? How do we do that globally? So shared learning is, a, is the second of the six. Third one is we've called, it's quite a broad one, it's called professionalizing patient safety. And by that, we mean that, that everyone is professional in understanding patient safety and systems thinking. So um, all, there's a requirement in the UK for all, um, for all healthcare organizations to ensure that they take re all reasonable and practical steps to improve patient safety. And one way to do that is to ensure that all staff are trained in system thinking and can prioritize patient safety. So all staff, not just clinicians, whether it is porters, whether it's governors, leaders, uh, uh, lab technicians, all need to have the knowledge, the skills, and the behaviors for safety. So it's kind of designing educational and in induction programs for that, supported by highly specialist and trained people, people that understand safety thinking, thinking people that use human factors and ergonomic skills for designing safe systems, and for us to have standards for patient safety in a way that in the UK, we have organizational standards for fire safety, and there's a requirement for leaders and uh, governors and boards to attend to those. We don't have the same set of standards for patient safety. So you've got an inconsistency of approach and an inconsistency of outcome that we think that needs to be addressed. I'm halfway through. I'm getting there. So the, uh, so the, um, so the other three of the six, one is around, the fourth one is around data and insight. How do we know not just where harm happens and how have we responded to it? And I think over the last 20 years, there's been a lot more investment in incident reporting systems and investigations that we still have challenges about the quality of investigations and how we get learning and how that learning is applied for action and improvement. But really, it's the flip side. So we've got the kind of lagging indicators, but what are the leading indicators? What are the, what are the how do we risk assess? How do we know whether we've got a resilient organization? How can we say what does safe look like and how are we designing our metrics and performance indicators to be safe? I think there's much more work that needs to be do, done on that area, the kind of more forward thinking area. 
The fifth area, which is one that's very close to my heart personally, because when I worked at WHO, I had the absolute honor of being the executive lead for a program that was led by patients. And in WHO, it was the Patients for Patient Safety program, which still continues and is, is being nourished by your colleagues north of the border. So the Canadian Patient Safety Institute are still doing grand things with this. So, and that's really about engaging patients in a, in a, not inviting them in, but co-producing health and social care for, for safety. And that's at three levels. One is at uh, the point of care. So, you know, the information asymmetry, the uh, patients and families having the knowledge, having the, uh, the, the authority, feeling comfortable about asking questions and supporting big part, almost at a part of an extended clinical team in their own care. The second stage of three is where if something goes wrong, patients' insight and wisdom as to what's gone wrong and to share um, and to give insight to learning and to share that for improvement is really important. Uh, and we d I don't think uh, as a health and social care systems globally, we do enough around inviting patients in to contribute to that. And then thirdly, um, uh, patients and families as advocates for, for social change, for a social movement for safety to say this extent of unsafe care it is is not you know it is is not good enough. Um, the risks are too high. The costs are too high. The um, OECD has said globally, ten to fifteen percent of all healthcare systems spent is as a consequence of unsafe care. So as well as the tragic um, reasons why people are harmed and 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 die avoidably the cost is ridiculous. So as, as societies, do we really, should we be really rethinking how we design our healthcare systems to make it safer? And then the final one, which is um, someone, I can't remember his name now, said culture eats strategy for breakfast and everything is all about organizational culture. How do we, how do we create our system and organizational culture for, for, for safety? So it's just, it's open. We, we're actively engaging with our staff and our patients. So we're learning, we're, we're being challenged, we're hearing where there are risks. We're not putting barriers to that. We're inviting people in, we're listening. We're thanking them when they're telling us areas that we can improve. Uh, and when things go wrong, we're not blaming individual professionals. We're, have got a much better understanding about system thinking and how we can make how we can design systems for healthcare workers to be safer when they're providing that care so we've yeah we've we've pushed those kind of six core foundations and then the two areas um, uh, that we're working on very actively as patient safety learning so sort of suggesting what others can do is, is all well and good, but actually how are we making that change happen? And we're actively designing our patient safety standards so that we could help organizations design their own safety systems. And, and that's something that we are actively working on now uh, and starting to share with, with uh, partners who are testing our thinking and, and giving us feedback. Uh, and that, that's going very well. Uh, and then the, um, the, the one that you might want to explore a little bit more about is, is our knowledge sharing platform. So finding knowledge of uh, examples of where things have gone wrong and how they've been, not just, just they've gone wrong, but how people have identified the causes and have taken action to improve it, how they've done that in the context of uh, quality improvement initiatives, but also how they've, how they've uh, learning from when things go well, how do you share that? There's a, we, we did a bit of work with Professor Carl McRae, who's very well known here in the, in the UK. And we asked him to look at how knowledge for safety is shared in other industries. And he gave us the example of Skybury from aviation. So if you want to know anything about safety in aviation, whether you're an aircraft manufacturer, whether you're a safety specialist working in, a, in an airline, uh, whether you're air traffic control, whether you're designing um, um, and uh, specifying and designing equipment for safety, everything is always on Skybury. Um, and we thought, wouldn't it be great if we had 
the healthcare skybury. So if someone says, I've got an issue on maternity care, or I'm concerned about safety culture, or I want to improve my reporting system, how do I find out where the good stuff is? And we launched this last October. So it's still fairly new. Uh, we've got a zero marketing budget because <laughs> we're a small charity. Uh, we're in 30 countries already. We've got thousands of pages of content. Some of that is peer-reviewed literature. Some of it's inquiries. The really great stuff is innovations and initiatives that people have developed around particular problems or issues. And we're using our, um, the hub to share that knowledge. So it's free at the point of use. Anyone can just go online and look at it. But if you become a member, you can, you can participate. And we want to create that kind of sort of family, that movement, where people share their good practice, their insights, they ask questions. And, and you know, the, the, I suppose the fundamental theme is knowledge has no boundaries. And we want to share this knowledge for improved patient safety and avoidance of harm. Uh, it's kind of UK focused mainly at the moment, but it is, we've got a lot of people from the Middle East, from Africa, US in particular, uh, about three, four weeks ago, 30% of our activity in one week came from the US. We'd obviously put content on there that kind of resonated. So yeah, so the, the safety standards work, the campaigning and influencing and the hub, the knowledge platform for patient safety is kind of our contribution and what, what we want to focus on. That's fabulous. And so the patient safety learning hub is free. Uh, yep. As you mentioned, are all of your resources free or is there a membership cost? No, no, they're all free at the moment. What, what, what we, we are working through that around our safety standards and how we, because we need to be a sustainable organization, right? So uh, we've got, we've been uh, helped to set up through philanthropy, but it may well be if we develop, uh, we're thinking of, 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 of different alternatives. One of them is around an accreditation, an organizational accreditation framework. I mean, there are uh, accreditation frameworks for, for quality, um, in different countries and globally, uh, but having a highly specialized one focusing on those six foundations on patient safety is, is not something that's currently there, and we think that would be valuable. If we did do that, that might be something uh, that we would want um, uh, resources to, to enable us to continue the work, and it may be that we, we develop an accreditation framework around individuals and their, their, their competence around safety and human factors. Uh, it, we're a young organization. Those are quite early days at the moment. But at the moment, uh, anything that you go onto our website, so our policy blogs, our thinking, um, and on our hub, all that content is free, free at the point of delivery. And we, we're actively engaging with, uh, with sponsors to sponsor the hub so that we can try and – um, we can reduce the hierarchy because the people that use the hub, they are, some of them are patient safety managers, specialists, quality specialists. They're also frontline clinicians, they're patients, they're policy makers, they're non-executive directors, they're researchers. It's the whole community. So we talk about safety system thinking and we're not thinking just as funders, insurers, um, providers. We're thinking of professionals, policymakers, manufacturers, every, uh, regulators, everyone that works to contribute to making a safe system, we want to embrace that, everyone in partnership for, for improvement. So, you know, the content um, is, is, is very wide ranging because we want it to be uh, a fabulous resource for everyone. Well, it sounds like it sounds like it's a great place for people who are passionate about patient safety to get involved. Oh, we'd love them. So, uh, I mean, please, everyone in your movement, uh, anyone that's watching this, please come to, to Patient Safety Learning website, but come to our hub and, and look at what we've got. If, if you like what we've got, please contribute to it. I mean, the, uh, the whole idea is that it's not our knowledge. What we are doing is helping share the knowledge and, and, and source it, secure it, promote it, uh, and celebrate it. But it, it, you know, the knowledge belongs to everyone. So if people see, see something that they find useful, tell us about it, why they thought it was good. We've had a, we had a great blog from uh, colleagues uh, from an exchange visit. Some of the stuff we put on there is anonymous. Uh, 
we always know who puts content on. We have very clear standards. We have moderators to ensure that. But sometimes, particularly healthcare professionals, find it difficult to put information on there, even if it's perfectly reasonable. Fear factor can be quite a thing on patient safety. And sometimes sharing knowledge requires layers of bureaucratic approval. So sometimes we will accept people's insights and blogs. We know who they are. We can attest for the quality of their work but we will keep their, um, their identity will be just between them and us. Because the main thing is that we get the insight and the knowledge for improvement out there. So people, please, please use it uh, and please share with us. Uh, challenge us to put more on there. Um, t help us find really good stuff and, um, and unite in sharing knowledge for improvement. Well, it sounds like a really great way for us to collaborate globally on this. As I say, it's kind of, it started, it's six months old, that's all. Uh, and we're delighted at, it, it, at its impact and how many people are using it. We would love it to go globally. And we will only do that with the, you know, with the support of amazing organizations such as yours and any promotion we get. So it's a kind of word of mouth thing. It's not, a, as I say, no marketing budget. So people liking it, telling their buddies, getting it on there. Um, please join. Yeah. Great. Well, Helen, thanks so much for joining us today. This is a, a fabulous resource. We're going to share it with our network and hopefully we will all be contributing to your hub and learning more from each other. Oh, please do. We'd, we'd absolutely be delighted if we could do that. Yeah, be great. Thanks for the opportunity, Donna. It's been great talking to you. You as well. Have a great day. Thank you.